farms have been in for five generations, right, Mike? Right. They, it's been in their family for five generations. And uh, I think it's important for us to share the history of this area. Yeah. This is a, a, an important part of our lives. Uh, any farm that, that we can trace back five generations is an important part of Halifax community. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Mike and let him give you all his information. <laughs> The, uh, the farm that I live in, one, uh, of course, is, is five generations. I should mention the, uh, the farm that I'm going to start out talking about, which everybody knows uh, when they drive up through and they see the white horses standing out along the road and so forth, where my mother lives and, of course, where I was raised. Uh, that was bought by my mother's grandfather, and uh, that's how that became uh, part of the family. Um, she was, uh, her mother was a Huffman. If you guys know, uh, Henny Huffman owned the Huffman store in Millersburg um, and several other properties throughout the Millersburg area and, and down here in Halifax. Uh, so that's the relationship, just to give you a little bit of background of, uh, that's not the Bauer farm. I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about that farm, but the farm, the other farm where I live on, just right back over the hill, in fact they join, is uh, the Bauer farm that uh, uh, has been in my family for now five generations. And uh, I'll go up through that, that lineage for you also. But uh, probably start out with uh, the one that you see most often driving by and so forth and uh, give you a little background on that farm. Now a lot of this, and I'll try and preface what is, is pretty well fact, and then there is a lot of stories, and some of you have heard those stories already, uh, about that farm and uh, I'm in the process but it takes a long time and unfortunately when you get interested in this probably when I was a kid and all the ancestors were living and so forth would have been the time to try and really get this information and unfortunately it's later on in life that we become older and then get interested in this and then a lot of the uh, ancestors have, have passed away and so a lot of this stuff becomes lost so uh, in part great for an organization like this to be in Halifax to try and help preserve some of this uh, history. So anyway, uh, to go on with the stories, uh, about uh, two and a half miles north of here on Route 147 uh, at 1347 uh, North River Road is, is Devour Farm as it's known today. Uh, my mother still lives there, uh, very active. She's uh, very young, 81 years old, and, and still keeps it going. Sometimes I think she's the farmer and not me, but uh, she uh, keeps, keeps after it. Um, some of the, the farm dates back uh, to pre-Civil War days, and actually in my research and some of the things, I have traced it back actually to pre-Revolution, uh, where the, uh, the house was built. Uh, I still don't know exactly when the house was built, but it is pre-revolution uh, where when the house was built. It uh, has to be one of the oldest in the area, and the bricks were actually made right there on site uh, where the house was built. Actually, approximately 200 yards uh, above the house up in the field, I still plow up where probably the ovens were and so forth that made the bricks. I still plow up old bricks. Uh, and so forth that were just weren't fit to use for the house and so forth and that's where the story was that the, the actually the bricks were made. Um, one of the things that uh, is, is interesting too is the house has uh, was built with uh, 16 rooms and six of these rooms are in the attic. There's actually six full rooms uh, up on the third floor. Each room on the first and second floor has its own fireplace. Every, the kitchen, every room has uh, a fireplace in it. There's uh, actually 13 fireplaces throughout the house um, that uh, are, are in that house. Um, under each of the fireplaces, in order to get a foundation to put these fireplaces, because they're right above each other in, in, in each of the, the rooms, there are solid stone cupboards uh, underneath in the basement uh, with stone shelves about approximately about uh, six inches thick that uh, support the fireplaces. And the cupboards have wooden doors and of course make great storage areas and that's where they, they uh, kept a, a lot of the things. Between the, uh, 
house, even the, the house has a huge hallway, and of course when you stand in the hallway, uh, on the first floor you can see clear to the third floor, clear up to the, to the, uh, to the roof. Underneath in the, base, in the basement to support that structure of the house, each, actually there's a hallway underneath the, the basement. Now again, our preface this area, we were told that those hallways, actually back at the end of each hallway was an oven, uh, an actual walk-in oven uh, that, that was uh, used and so forth. Um, by what's there and so forth, it's hard to tell that they were an oven or not, but uh, that's, that's what we've been told. Actually in the basement, underneath the kitchen is an actual uh, huge walk-in, I could walk right in the fireplace, a huge fireplace that had, of course, the swinging kettle and, and everything. In fact, the, the apparatus to hold the kettle and everything is still intact uh, in that. Uh, and then upstairs, the uh, kitchen was exactly the same way. It was a huge fireplace. Uh, my family, when my dad was there and so forth, uh, he actually, it got changed a little bit. We actually inserted a heater and the fireplace in there, of course, uh, got bricked in a little bit. But, uh, that's what, and the other fire bases are just fairly small, maybe three feet by three feet, uh, two, two and a half feet deep fire bases in all the other rooms. Uh, they aren't funk, I mean, they were functional one time, of course, for heat purposes, we have them boarded off and so forth. As far as up underneath, you can still look in and see the bricks of the fireplace and so forth, but where the air would go up through the, uh, to the chimney and so forth. If you'd ever, and, and you see, I think in one or two of the pictures over here, you can actually see it when, when you, after I'm done here, you're welcome to come up and look at the, the things I have up here. You can actually see the different uh, flues for each of the fireplaces. A lot of these uh, the ch uh, chimneys that you see at the top of the house, if you're able to do an aerial view and look down in, there's actually three separate flues because each chimney takes care of three fireplaces. So, so anyway, um, that's uh, some, some stories about the, uh, the house. Um, the original farm, too, one of the first things, and, and I don't know which picture of the, the, this is not, of course, the original barn. The original barn actually sat, if you see the horses here, actually sat almost tight against the road. Now, you'll see the original barn in any of the pictures here, but, uh, that did not burn down or anything like some people there's there's some stories uh, that that barn burnt and so forth that barn actually just fell down it deteriorated over time uh, it was almost right against route 147 if you when you go up through if you look at the defense that i have coming out there by the horses and it makes the right hand turn if you look you see that you can actually see some of the stones that have the ground has washed away from the barn and that's where the original barn uh, sat. Um, later on, when uh, Henny Huffman bought the, bought the farm, um, he, he then uh, built the barn, the white barn that you see, that you would have seen way back going by. And then, of course, uh, I have an article here and so forth in, in the 80s, if some of you remember when uh, we had the barn, the uh, barn burnt and uh, was destroyed, and we tried to the best of our ability, except maybe for the white and so forth, to try and put it back the original shape and, and so forth with the Gambria roof. Uh, that was a rough year for, for that area up here, if you remember. Uh, uh, my dad's barn burnt uh, that year. About uh, six months later, my barn burnt, and six months later, the beach barn uh, burnt. And to this day, we still don't know what happened. Um, it wasn't spontaneous combustion. Both barns were, you know, it was uh, burnt from the outside. The hay did not burn from the inside out. Uh, so nobody knows if they're set or, or what went on, but uh, that's uh, what happened there. Um, okay. So anyway, um, the barn, like I said, was built, the, the white barn was built by uh, Henny Huffman, grandfather of my mother, and, uh, and then also after the fire, another barn was built in that location. Now, according to search of deeds, 
and uh, any of you have, have tried to do this, I spent days in the courthouse uh, many, many years ago and then got sidetracked and actually didn't get back on it again until I got the call from Carol. Uh, but anyway, uh, 1765 was the first deed found for this property. So that's why I said in some of the history that was told to you before, I think, or is in our, uh, actually our centennial book, it mentions pre-Civil War. Well, actually, it, it's going back farther than that. And it was known as the Mansion Plantation. And uh, that track of land belonged to a John Meach. And a lot of people don't r realize what, what that farm controlled was all the farm, all the land from where my mother lives all the way up to McClellan Road. That was all under one farm. Um, it was uh, the... Uh, um, it was deeded, yeah, the track belonged to John Meach and it extended to McClellan, so it's four farm. actually there's four farms now that were broken off from that track. Um, he deeded the property to a Robert Bowes. Uh, there again, there was some confusion because when you look at and try and look at some of this writing that you see up here, you know, Bowes can be con con construed as Bower and so forth and, and uh, but it was actually a Robert Bowes that bought the property on June 26, 1826. And uh, when Robert Bowes died, now here's where things start to get a little fuzzy again. Um, in this story, Robert Bowes died and then his executor deeded 63 acres to Henry Musser. And uh, even though the math doesn't work out, the story's been told that the original track was then divided into four 63-acre farms, and that's how you get the existing farms today that uh, go up through there. And uh, those, of course, were known as the, uh, the Fairchild Farm, the Mater Farm, the Shepley Farm, and, uh, and the Henny Huffman Farm. Uh, if you know, if you, if you think, uh, let me see if I get the current owners, uh, where Robert Latchaw is a Fairchild, Fairchild Farm. Uh, the Mater Farm is actually the farm that uh, I'm on here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rank, uh, we just purchased for the purposes of, of uh, putting in hopefully some, some athletic fields. And then you come on down through to uh, the Sheppey Farm. And I think the current owners of the Sheppey Farm are here, Galen and Faye. Uh, they're here. And then on down naturally to the, to the farm that we, we live on now. Um, Henry Musser deeded the property to Hannah Pree Freeland. Now, again, this is where you're going to hear another little story here at this point in time. And the widow, the widow of Colonel James Freeland. And then, uh, and then at that point, we we get back into some actual facts. Okay, <laughs> where uh, uh, Freeland then deeded the, pro the, the property to Dr. John and Mary Valershamp. And Dr. Valershamp was a dentist in the area. Uh, so a lot of people probably didn't realize that we had a dentist in Halifax Township, but that's, that's what he was an efficient physician, he was a dentist. So I'll back up a little bit and uh, just uh, change the story a little bit and uh, actually what happened in another account was uh, before the Civil War, uh, Colonel Freeland, and uh, you probably heard this story too, and, and like I say, there's about 30 years in here, there's a little gap that it's just hard to prove anything, and I'm not sure which is the right story, but one of the other stories that came out is Colonel Freeland and Mr. Loomis were playing a serious game of poker. Mr. Loomis was losing. He had several thousand dollars in the hole. He was several thousand dollars in the hole when he decided to bet the brick house and a farm and many acres of farmland to cover his debt. And Colonel Freeland won the poker game with an ace, and he collected the deed to his property as payment in full. So that's, that's one of the stories. And then, that's when it got broken up into the four pieces. Colonel Freeland's family, consisting of a wife and four sons, moved there. When the four sons were grown up, the farm was divided into four equal areas of 63 acres each. These four farms are now known as the Fairchild, the Mater, the Sheppey Farm, and now the Haney Huffman Farm. So uh, that's another uh, story that goes along with. <laughs> uh, so there's there's a there's a point in history there where there is a little bit of uh, 
confusion. Um, but going on from that, then with, with Colonel, we know Colonel Freeland owned the farm. I mean, there's no question about that. One, one account has the widow owning the farm, and another account has him that he was actually there and, and owned the farm uh, before he passed. And I didn't really go, go down and research out, was probably in Civil War archives, I could probably start verifying that. But with Colonel Freeland, you probably, some of you probably heard the story and uh, was, was in the process of trying to verify that too, is, of course, the story is uh, that one story out there is that when Abraham Lincoln was on the way to Gettysburg to get the Gettysburg Address, he stopped by the farm to visit the retired Colonel Freeland uh, before he went on down through Harrisburg and, and down to Gettysburg to give the address. And, uh, of course, the Bowerchamp family uh, claims, their heirs claim to still have a stovepipe hat that he left there. He actually changed clothes. If you remember your history, he was, there was going to be an assassination attempt on his life in Harrisburg. And he actually changed clothes there. Colonel Freeman has to go incognito. Now, one of the things in my research that I found out, and, and I was checking with some Civil War buffs, and, and there, I didn't really... Nobody's really sure about him going through Harrisburg before he gave the Gettysburg Address. But uh, in 1861, when he was president-elect, he did come to Harrisburg. Uh, he was in Harrisburg. That's a documented historical fact that uh, he was in Harrisburg. So I'm thinking that, well, if the train didn't come through Halifax at that time, maybe it did come through in 1861. So, that you know, I'm just giving that as uh, they feel, really feel fairly confident that he did stop and visit that house and actually uh, did go through Halifax, uh, which, and I, I really love to document and prove that because, I mean, I think that would be a great <laughs> historical fact for Halifax to realize that uh, a president, you know, actually uh, passed through this area and, and stopped by to, to visit one of his uh, Civil War colonels. So, uh, Okay, um, yeah, and, and if you check the dates, and, and Colonel Freeland, uh, the Freeland family owned the house at that time, you know, the Gettysburg Address was in 1863, his visit to Harrisburg was in 1861. Um, so the, the times do jive, and, and at that time the, the house was uh, owned by uh, Freeland. Um, there's a, another Nito story, and we kind of proved that as a family when we were doing a little bit of remodeling. Um, Dr. Valachamp, uh, of course, he, he loved his hard cider and uh, <laughs> um, partaked of it pretty regularly. And uh, in the kitchen area, in the big fireplace, he built a fire in the kitchen's open fireplace, and sitting back in his rocking chair and drinking hard cider, he owned only set the kitchen on fire. Um, and uh, actually when we did some remodeling in the kitchen, the bricks are all scorched, uh, all black, uh, behind the, the plaster and so forth. So we feel that this is uh, fairly accurate. Uh, now some of the comments about it, but passerbys summoned the fire company and upon arrival, old John declared, it's just beginning to get warm in here now. And evidence <laughs> remains to, to confirm this, uh, this kitchen fire. <laughs> um, so on uh, January uh, 19th, uh, actually, well, Henry Huffman bought the farm in June 8th of 1942. He passed it on to his son, um, uh, H. Henry Huffman, which was Herb Huffman, and on January 19th, 1950. And uh, at that time, in 1950, is when that white barn was erected, when he bought it. And also the uh, the other buildings that went up, uh, the three car. If, if you see that kind of three car garage that, that sits there, there's a grain area up above that went up in, in that era too. Um, I'm not sure about the barn, but I know for definitely because because uh, the uh, the the blocks that were used to build the the garage that sets off to the side of the barn where that actually came from uh, devices. When they, when they had the block company and, and were making, making blocks. The barn, I can't verify that or not. 
I almost have to assume if you build them fairly close that that the blocks came from probably both both uh, you know from the devices for both buildings. And then on June twenty fifth, uh, nineteen seventy nine, uh, of course that's when my brother or my mother uh, ended up with the property. Uh, we moved there as as uh, as a family in nineteen fifty nine. Uh, 58, 59 in that, in, in that time frame. Uh, I was probably about five years old. Actually, we lived, uh, before that we lived, and I see there here uh, is in uh, Hunsinger's house, right across from Joey's Autoplex is where my dad used to truck farm there uh, on that farm. And of course, when he had the five boys at home, we, we had about two, three acres of strawberries, so we had plenty of help, and, and we actually, uh, <laughs> Did a lot of truck farming before he moved down to, to the current farm and, and did uh, expand the farm. Um, so since the, the late 40s, uh, the area, you know, the farm was known for its black Angus cattle. Uh, actually, my uh, Henny Huffman report, they had registered black Angus, and of course, we kept it going. And of course, the white tail fence around, around the uh, entire farm and, and so forth, that kind of got shrunken up a little bit now, and, uh, and so forth. Um, let's see, we talked about uh, Lincoln's journey, um, traveling through. <clears throat> now, one of the things that uh, you're probably we're interested in, and, and unfortunately, there's, there's some gray area here, too, is, is the horses. And uh, it's one of the most famous landmarks around this area. And uh, the two white iron horses, and, that, and they are made of cast iron. Their legs are molded cast iron, and they have a cast iron frame up through, up through to the head and so forth. And then uh, cement is used to mold the body and, and make the shape of, of the body. Um, so we're, they were bought by uh, Henry Huffman in uh, 1953 um, from, of course, uh, Tommy Fairchild. And uh, I don't know if you people uh, re remember uh, Tommy, but the, up at the Red Rose Motel, uh, that used to be a little gas station. There was a little country store uh, in there, and that's, that's where uh, Tommy Fairchild uh, had, had his store and station, which right behind was the Tommy Fairchild farm, uh, when I, what, I, what I talked about earlier. Um, and. Uh, <coughs> Actually, uh, Tommy sold them to uh, to my uh, be my great grandfather, but uh, and at that time, uh, Tommy was uh, I think he was going into to uh, one of the things I just found out. He was supposedly going to a home and so forth at that time, and he stipulated to my great grandfather that if, you know he'd sell them to him, but he wants them to sit out along the road, close to the road as possible, so that every time he goes back and forth to the home, he can see them. And so that's why that area where they were picked to, to sit is, is where they are, and that's where they originally were placed and, and still there today. Um, how they were moved down, actually, and probably a lot of you here remember him, uh, George Weaver. Uh, and if you remember that big old record he had is, is one of the things that was used to lift them and put them onto a little boy and of course they were hauled down to their current location. Because um, each horse weighs about a thousand pounds. Uh, there's not something you're going to grab and run off with. <laughs> one of the things my, that uh, my mom still has up in the attic, we keep them there. They're, they're getting to look pretty bad, but the horses do have real horse hair manes and tails. But we don't put them on. I think uh, even in the one picture with Tommy, where Tommy Fairchild's with them, uh, the manes are, are off because the weather would just destroy them. But uh, and of course, the bridles are made of uh, of metal too, and uh, that they wear. Uh, and then they have the, the glass eyes. One of the things uh, the five boys up there. I mean, we were never really mischievous, but uh, a lot of people would love to stop by and. And look at the horses on Sundays and so forth. And of course, we had a pony, our pony named Pixie. Um, and we always thought it was a real treat to take a shovel full of uh, 
drop-ins and put behind the fender. <laughs> and uh, people would come and scratch their heads. They'd look at the droppings behind the, the horses out front and just wonder what was, what was going on. So, <laughs> uh, But we never did anything like that. Um, as far as where Tommy Fairchild got him, that's when, when I'm getting uh, a couple different stories. Now, one of the original stories uh, about the horses and where they came from, of course, is, is a little bit far-fetched, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. But supposedly they came over from England. That was one, one story we heard about the horses. Uh, it was just recently that we were approached by uh, somebody from the Lancaster County area. Well, not re it was a, good, a couple years ago. Um, a family approached us from Lancaster County and said, they spied the horses, I guess they were going by, and said, well, they, they were from our family. So they stopped in and talked to my mother and so forth. And according to their uh, recollection and so forth, their father, back in the early 40s, sold the farm, and those horses actually sat on top of a milk house. In fact, there's pictures when, he, when we're done here and you want to get up and look. There's actually pictures of the two horses sitting on top of a milk house with a, a railing around. And... Uh, they claim that they were on their farm, and of course that they were forged and made in a foundry in Mount Joy, in Lancaster <coughs> County. So um, that's that's one of the that's the other story. Uh, that sounds a little bit more believable, uh, and I'm actually pursuing that one right now. The the person there used to be a, called a White Horse Antique Barn down in Mount Joy. That person, uh, when I talked, I just in fact I just called the family the other day to try and get some more background for the night, and, and they said, well, he moved away uh, about in 1996. His business went bankrupt, and he lost everything and has moved out of the area, but they were going to try and track him down for me because supposedly this, this elderly gentleman had this business, uh, knows the history behind these horses. Um, there's a little bit of discrepancy with that, too, in the time frame. We're wondering if that is another set of horses or not, because uh, my mother swears, and I don't know any other people here that, uh, you know, are, are uh, been here for a while and so forth, um, she swears that even in the four, early 40s that they were at Tommy Fairchild's. Um, she doesn't remember, she was a little, she thinks she remembers seeing them when she was a little girl. Um, I, we're not really sure. Um, and if that's true, because according to these people, these horses, didn't get sold down there in Lancaster County until about 1946, 47, and if my uncle bought them in 53 and they were actually at Tommy's that long, that puts a little bit of question whether or not which 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 story is true. So that's an interesting uh, problem, and, and uh, I've been out trying to research it, and hopefully we can get a, a clear-cut answer because it would be nice to find out. Another thing that was ironic was uh, a few years ago, my brother was actually driving, he lives down in Adams County and so forth, and was actually driving around the area, and on Route 94, and you're going to see two color pictures up here, on Route 94, down going towards Hanover, from York Springs to Hanover, there is a single horse that is under a shelter, and it's exactly like the horses that we have up here on the, on the Ballard Farm. It's exactly like that horse, and you'll see pictures up here. Well, unfortunately, at the time when he was going through, the owner wasn't at home, and and uh, we never really approached to, to go back, and, and probably that's one area where I could probably maybe find some history out, because it, hopefully they may even know where they got their horse. And Because uh, there's stories that there was only six, six made, um, but we now have found three of them. We don't know where the other three are. And that's again, a, you know, a story that we're not sure is true or not. Was there only six made, or or not? So, uh, because there's other one other story that came out of it was they were in Virginia. They came up on a train from Virginia. Three, three, three of the horses fell off the train and broke, and, and were destroyed. And then, yeah. A uh, long time ago, I talked to your dad about these. Right. Things. And he, at that time, informed me that there was one, there was two sets of them. Right. And that's all he said. There was a set like this, and then there's another set of two. 
Mm-hmm. That's what you told me. I mean, that's a long time. Right, right. Your dad said that. But there is, there is, I know there are stories, you know, and like I said, it's just kind of wading through those stories and trying to figure out, well, what is, what is right and what isn't. And, uh, yeah, I, I heard that too. And then, of course, there were six sets, supposedly six sets. And, and uh, but this, the horse down there is, is, it's, it's so uncanny, it's, it's really close and almost exactly like the horses up here. I mean, they painted a little different and so forth, but uh, so that's that's uh, very, you know, interesting there that uh, there actually, actually was another horse located. Um, and the fact that it's pretty close to Lancaster County maybe starts to firm up the story about them, about them being made in Lancaster County. Because uh, one of the things, I, I went out on the internet to hook, look for foundries, uh, in Mount Joy, and of course, uh, one to my realization, I guess, being so young, I guess, <laughs> and not realizing, but even in Halifax here, I believe about every three miles there was some kind of foundry uh, back in, at that time. Every community had some kind of iron foundry that they made, made things and so forth. So uh, that wasn't really... Uh, <laughs> uh, I was able to track anything down there. So that's the story on the horses, and like I say, there's pictures there for you to look at. Now moving back over the hill uh, from where my mother's farm is, uh, is another farm that of course I live on and, and own now, and that's the farm where I have traced back, you know, with five generations of ours. And uh, of course, you know, my wife and I, Gail, uh, own it now, and of course, and my father and mother, John and Virginia, uh, they owned it uh, back in 1968 when they bought it from my grandmother, uh, and then moved to Millersburg, and uh, it, um, her, her husband was Harry Bauer, uh, probably some of you people might have known him, they, they nicknamed him Blinky, uh, I don't know if you ever hear the term Blinky Bauer, that was, that was my grandfather's nickname. Um, there's, I didn't bring it along, there's some, some history with him. He was actually uh, hurt really bad in an accident up here going around the mountain. He actually worked for the state. He was worked for the state and he ran the cinder wagon. He had a pair of mules and, and pulled uh, the wagon load of cinders on 147 back and forth and made sure that the road was cinder. And one night he was cindering going up around the mountain towards Millersburg and uh, of course a truck hit the, uh, smashed into him and hit the wagon and uh, he had a hit head injury and, and uh, of course didn't work from there on. But uh, that was uh, some, a lot of people don't realize how he cindered back then. They used a horse and, horse and wagon. Actually, the, they actually did even cinder roads. <laughs> So uh, that was an interesting story, and I didn't bring the newspaper article along, but I actually even have the newspaper clipping from it. Then he bought it from his father, John Franklin, who was married to Ellen, and uh, and then we get back to the fifth generation, uh, he where he bought it from his father, which is Michael, and he had his wife Mary, and that's actually a picture of Michael and Mary. I don't know if there's not much resemblance there or not. <laughs> and this is actually a picture of the house back when Michael and Mary uh, and went up through the Bowers the way it looked when they owned it. Um, there's a picture up here with my grandfather uh, on the pony, on, on one of the mules he had. And uh, actually, the, the pair of mules that you see down here. Uh, this isn't my father, this is actually my uncle uh, Harry. Uh, everybody knows him as Dick Bauer. He lives in Millersburg now. He actually lived back on the farm, uh, the old Schiffer farm, which uh, when, it, when we go back through the deeds here, when it starts to hit the area of John Franklin Bauer, a lot of people don't realize uh, it's a 70, about a 75 acre farm now. Before that, it was, um, about, uh, well actually it's before the Bowers, I'm so great, getting ahead of myself here. It was about 217 acres. And when I traced the deeds back through, this is, this is great because one day I was sitting in the house one Sunday and uh, a car pulled in my, my driveway from, uh, I forget where they were from, um, Carol, huh? Ohio. Ohio, that's right, they were from Ohio. 
And uh, they pulled into my house and, and pulled up and said, are you Michael Bauer? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, did you have any relatives named Michael? And of course, I went back and said, yes, I have Michael Bauer who bought the farm from a John Schwab. Well, we're the ancestors from the John Schwab family. We came and we wanted to see what the farm looks like now. And lo and behold, we traded information. They had the entire lineage of the farm um, with them, and they gave me a copy of tracing back the farm. And uh, the farm goes all the way back to uh, uh, actually to 1772. Uh, where Margaret are, are starting to back and come front. Margaret Duncan owned the farm in 1772. She had a land grant for William Penn. Uh, in 73, it was surveyed, and then actually in August 4th of 19, 1773, it was it put in the book, uh, book double A, volume 14, page 17, 217 acres, 80 purchases. Uh, it was passed on to the executors of, of uh, Margaret Dugan, to a Matthew Dugan, and a Lolita Dugan, and a Reverend James Gray, is, is who inherited the farm. And from there, it went to a Nicholas Straw, uh, owned a farm in 1816. That's in Land Book uh, 1, page 518. And our, I can even give you some prices uh, to give you some, to say what land values have changed at. He bought the farm, and at this time it was still 217 and a half acres. He bought the farm for $1,850. Okay. Then um, there must have been, land prices must have really dropped because in 1818, two years later, Nicholas Straw sold it to a Nicholas Hempting for $925. And then Nicholas Hamp Hampton died, and he had two sons, uh, uh, J.N., which is John, and uh, Isaiah. And in the will it was written, he died March 12, 1885, and then that's when the farm was split. Uh, part of the farm stayed um, with Isaiah, and the other part went to Nicholas Hampton. And the farm, the original farm, and probably for you people who don't live up in that area, there's a place, the original farm went from where I live now all the way back to the foot of the mountain, back to the reservoir. Um, I know Dave Schwamm's there, he owns the farm where my uncle used to own. That was part of the original farm. And the piece that was broken off and, and uh, was, was that piece where the, I know it as a Schiffer farm, I don't know what everybody else here recognizes that, but uh, my uncle Harry owned it. And we farmed it back there. The Red Brick House that sets on McClellan Road, and then of course Dave Schwann purchased it, and uh, and so on. So that's that's where that came from. Then Isaiah Hempling sold, sold it in 1867 to a John Schwab for four thousand five hundred eight dollars and seventeen cents. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the deed where Michael and Mary bought it, uh, but. Uh, um, that's when, of course, they sold it and, and passed it on, and that's when it hit the Bauer family. One of the nice things about that, well, one of the things about that farm is we live, that's, that's the farmhouse was built in 1812, uh, right above the front door, and I don't know why when we did the siding and so forth, we actually covered it up. I don't know, I was, wasn't thinking at the time, I should have had it framed out. The carved in the door is 1812. It's a solid log house. Uh, built from logs, it's built all out of chestnut. Um, the ceiling and all the floors are plank ceilings, has a chestnut plank boards in it. And when you go up into the attic, when I first moved in, of course, it wasn't insulated and so forth, and, and I wanted to insulate, and when I started prying up some of the big 12 inch boards to, to insulate, I noticed Roman numerals were key, were cut into the one of the rafters. And basically, when I started looking and examining the house, on the side of the beam, there's a 12 inch by 12 inch beam that goes the whole length of the house. Not a cut in it, not a splice in it anywhere. It's solid. And there's three of them in each floor. There's one in each floor. It goes the whole length and carved into the side of the beam is a Roman numeral. If you go to the first beam, it's Roman numeral one. You look at the beam, it's Roman numeral one. 
Deck two, three, four. You look at the roof rafters, a Roman numeral key to <coughs> cut into each one of them. And I guess it was so when they cut it out on the ground and hoisted it up, and then he drove wooden pegs. When he slid it together, they drove wooden pegs in to hold it. I guess, you know, just to know to make sure that they put one into one, uh, slot A into slot B, or slot A into slot A, is what they tried to do. So it's an interesting uh, thing of how they built that house. Um, another interesting thing is, is that how they built the house is, is, is a solid log house, but the log it, is framed out in logs, but the logs that fit in between go vertical. They're not horizontal like you would think of, of a typical log house. They actually stand vertical uh, within the house, and that's how the, the, the house was framed out. Um, of course, there's a lot of history, and I could go on all night. I want to keep you here. Uh, with that home, there's actually a little, and you, and you run into the hallway, there's actually a little store in that house where uh, probably my great grandfather sold candy and, and things like that, and, and so forth, to passerbys and, and so forth. Um, some of the things I, I have up here, too, is uh, this is Michael's school book. Um, Actually, uh, a good many years ago, somebody, another uh, family member uh, that, that uh, isn't a Bauer, but was married into the Bowers and so forth, had, had found it. And since I was a namesake, um, passed it on to me. So it, it's kind of interesting to see what a school, a school book looked like, uh, a juvenile reader. He even uh, signed his name inside and his initials. So, kind of a, a neat keepsake there. Um, a bower, here's just one of the things I found where a bower actually uh, sat on the school board um, back in, uh, it was John B. Bower who lived here in Halifax somewhere. In fact, one of these deeds, I was telling some of the people before I found a deed, it's down here near a livery stable where a bower owned property. Um, and that was in 1913 sat on the Halifax School Board. Um, so, um, I think that's about it. I, I gave you a, <laughs> uh, this is a neat old map that gives a lot of the history of the, of the land, uh, how, how Halifax Township was laid out back in the 1700s. Um, I guess the main thing is, that, you know, hang around here, you're welcome to look at this stuff, uh, or answer, or try to answer some questions and uh, give you some history. I, I think uh, I have some old tax bills here. Um, and me being the business manager in the school district, I'm sure I wish I could roll these back for you to this, <laughs> this time frame. But uh, uh, in, 19, uh, in 1892, the tax bill for, uh, uh, for actually it was, uh, for the Bower was $4.08. Uh, $4.29 county tax and 21 cents abatement. And then in 19, uh, see, tax, I want to point this out to you, taxes doubled in that era too, because from 1892 to 1908, it went up to $8.24, so it did double. So we're not the only ones that double taxes. Uh, uh, you had a work tax and a per capita tax and so forth, but you're welcome to look at these. And then in 1911, uh, the school and building tax was $16.68. So the county tax was $12.51. And the tax collector was a W.D. Straw. So maybe you guys might even know something about that. But if only if we could roll back to that time <laughs> Um I think that's it. Did I cover pretty well everything that you wanted to hear? <laughs> Uh, and maybe more than what you wanted to hear. <laughs> but uh, I hope it was interesting, and, and I know as far as, you know, the family. Um, one of the things I wanted to add, what, what was great, because a lot of this starts happening when you just start, you know, it's amazing how many people uh, try and, and do the genealogy and so forth and, and foul, find things out. Because originally, I was under the impression, and falsely under the impression, that Michael and Mary were actually the ones that came over from Germany. Now, I heard a story, stories about that Michael Bauer 
was involved in finding, uh, was part of the uh, Federhoff's church, in finding actually was the German Reform UCC side of the Federhoff church. And uh, actually, uh, we had Warren Bauer actually called me on the phone, and he lives in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And of course, he has a lot of history, and uh, one known to me, he was the one that kind of set me straight as far as to my ancestors. The one that actually came over, we don't know his birth date, was Michael Bauer Sr. Uh, we know he died in 1823. He was married to a Catherine Reese first, uh, and uh, actually uh, died in 1773, but before he died, he had Michael Bauer Jr. And uh, of course, at that time, and, and if you ever go through, this is the lineage of the Bauer family that we, we pulled together. And if you go through, a lot of people back in the 1700s, of course, the, the wife died either in childbirth or soon after childbirth. And of course, Michael Bauer remarried to, uh, after his first wife died, about, she died about uh, a year after Michael was born and married Veronica. Well, there's history that Michael and Veronica, um, let's see, let me get this straight, but Michael and Veronica were actually the ones along with, um, I forget the other people's names I have in here, but the Federhoff Church when it was established and, and Michael and Veronica were involved and was one of the trustees of that church and established uh, it was shared by, at that time, now I was always told it was shared by the Reform and the Lutheran, which I think later on it was. But back in the 1700s, what I've been finding out, it was shared by the Reform and the Presbyterian. Uh, it's one of the things that, that came out in, uh, I wish I had that here. Let me see if I can find that quickly. Uh, but I don't know if that's true or not, because some of this... Um, I don't think so, Mike. Uh, they have... Uh, but they actually have... They, see, I was always told it was a reform in the Lutheran. It was Lutheran. I know, and, and, of course, Michael was a German reform. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, we do not know the main name of Michael's wife, Veronica. This actually letter came from Moscow, Idaho, uh, from a Marion Wise, who was, who was married to uh, a Bauer. And... Uh, the Bowers, as well as the Freeburn, seem to be good friends of the Federhoffs and Kiters. So perhaps she was a daughter of one of those families. Michael was chosen trustee of the German Reformed Church along with Daniel Miller. Does that make? But the Kiter was a, a Lutheran minister. Yeah. Now who represents who represented the Presbyterian Church in forming the Federhoff Church? Now that's what they're saying. And who was Miller? And with Miller purchased from Jabel Dress family the land for the new church. Now, that's again something yeah. that contradicts. And family was Lutheran too, so yeah. I, I always heard. Well, I always heard it was a Lutheran church. Yeah, uh, or the Presbyterian. I never heard of the Presbyterian. Yeah, I never heard of that either. Um, as far as you know, um, that happening. So that's why when when you do research like this, it really takes a lot of work and, and so forth to really go back through. And that's why I even. Tell you, I mean, I could have stood up here and said, oh, that's fact and everything, but I always preface a lot of these comments I make as, you know, it's the best of our knowledge, and, uh, you know, someday, I, if we keep researching, hopefully we'll find the truth. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I was always told by my grandfather and so forth, because a lot of Bowers are buried out of Federal so I know that's where the family pot is. For the Bowers and so forth. Fred Ludwig told me that Katrina and Michael were buried out there. Who is Fred Lettick told me that. Right. Katrina and Michael are very Yeah, in fact, I, this is where I got the, okay. Michael's book. He, he, some of this stuff was actually, uh, Fred, Fred found, uh, it was with uh, John Bauer, if you remember him, Big jo they called him Big John. That was my dad's cousin. Okay, and that, that's how they were getting. And actually, when uh, Fred uh, married his daughter, Kathy, um, he found a lot of this information relating back to the to the Bauer farm that I live on.
he had stopped by my store over the weekend and said he was coming tonight and was going to give you some more pictures and things that, oh, okay. that are of the family. And I was shocked that he wasn't here. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't put out, I have a box full of stuff back here, and it, it's there's, there's hundreds of stuff, but I, I pretty well wanted to key in what we were going to talk about tonight and, and just give you a little bit of history behind that farm up there. And it it got to be one of the oldest homes in Halifax, um, you know, in the Halifax area here. So uh, I just wanted to give you some a little bit of background on that. And, uh, and like I say, these two deeds here, uh, I'm really not certain. Uh, this, is, this is Bowers actually living here in the borough of Halifax. Uh, the one D here mentions being the house being next to the Liberty, the Liberty Stable that I think was down here on Armstrong Street. Uh, so the Bower, he didn't own the Liberty Stable, but was down and lived next to it. Uh, so there's some other interesting uh, things up here to take a look at. Any questions? Yeah. I have just two tidbits, so you might want to add to your collection. Sure. My dad drove trucks to the Pennsylvania truck lines and he moved up here in 1942. So I think it was around 1946, I was trying to figure out what he was saying, because uh, I don't remember of it. But he said that horses came in on the train and he was assigned to truck the Pennsylvania truck for this. And then you said George Weaver got involved in somehow, but he was at the farm. Whoever it was that took them off the truck, they were crates and pieces. And they put them together there, and whoever owned the farm said uh, they weren't sure where they got the horses at. And my dad heard this man say, well, you decide where you want them, because once they're together, they're not going to be moved. Mm -hmm. Are you sure that wasn't at the Fairchild? Because they can't be taken apart. I don't know. That might have been up at the Fairchild, because my the, the movement from Fairchild, my mother remembers. She was, I mean... She remembers it very vividly when, when the horses were hauled down, uh, when they were moved from that. I mean, that wasn't that, that was 1950, it was the year I was born. Actually, I was born in 53, and uh, that's when he moved. And then we moved down to the farm in about 58, 59 in that area. Uh, that's when we moved down, and the horses were there. I wanted to clear that up because I think a lot of people have a misnomer that those horses were always there, and, and they were not. They're, they're not, I mean, they've been there 50 years now, but. They weren't there the whole life of the farm. Well, I don't even remember, but your dad told me the whole story of the horse, but I just don't remember what he told me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he told me the <laughs> <laughs> Well, and a lot of it, you know, it, it, and, and, you know, some of it is what we heard and, and just rehashing. I'm trying to get to the bottom of, okay, because, like I said, I, I went through, you know, you heard the England story, you heard the Virginia story, you know, you hear so many stories now, which one is right? And, and that's what I'm looking at. The most believable, I'm starting to make sense, is, is the Lancaster one. Uh, that, that almost makes, makes sense. And I'm, although, if, if you talk to my mother was here tonight, and I, I thought she was going to come, and then she wasn't, and then she was, and, and uh, she said, nah, she, she doesn't think she wants to. But anyway, uh, you know, she, uh, she swears those horses were there when she was a little girl. At the yeah. Fairchild. At the Fairchild. So they were at your farm when you moved there when you were a little boy? Yes. They were already there? They were already there. They moved down in 53 is when they bought them from. My mother actually has the receipt where, where he paid Tommy Fairchild and bought them and, and they moved them down. Um, yes? I often heard that there's so many secret passageways in that brick house. No, no, not, I mean, and I'll tell you, five little boys running around that house, we would have found them. <laughs> but uh, there, there's, there's none that, that we, we knew of or, or could, could find. I mean, we had a lot of fun in that house. Uh, you know, the, the big thing was, you know, boys would be boys and, you know, like the big thing, we watch our black and white TV there, watch horror stories, and of course, some of the brothers were like to walk up the stairs and drag chains across the third floor and things like that. And then moving out of the two-bedroom house to that one. Yeah, that yeah. Actually, a... actually, we were all in one. Yeah, uh, my mother had five up uh, where Huntsingers live now. Of course, and at the time that house was half the size of what you guys had. You guys added on to it. We moved you out. You said five boys, and then your uncle did have three boys, and guess right. where we go? Two girls. Two girls. Yeah. 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 But uh, now we, 
didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, the price is on that Schiffer farm. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, years and years ago. Not I know, before. but in 1962, when did bought it, I know what he paid for it. it was right. Thirteen five. Right. In so fact, we were going. We were going to buy it at the time. The store. Dick wasn't there. My dad. Uh, it just to. Just to give you an idea of land prices at that time and the, the way you struggle with them and stuff, if you just would have only known, um, you know. But we're standing there and Dick couldn't be there. Dick wanted to buy it because it, it attached right to the other Bower Farms and stuff and it was part of the original Bower Farm. And so we wanted to buy it and uh, Dick said, well, don't go over 12000 That's enough for that place. And uh, so my dad's back there, it was, uh, Clegg owned it before, uh, at that time, and, and, uh, ran it up, and my dad's looking at mom, and, you know, what do we do, what do we do, and, and finally my dad took it up and said, well, if Dick don't want it, we'll take it, you know, and, and, of course, he came home, and Dick said, well, no, I'll take it for that, so, it, it is just to, to give you an idea, it's to struggle at that time of how much, and then, of course, land just took off in, in the area here. But uh, it, it was uh, interesting to see how land prices have changed <laughs> through through time. And like I said, when I was reading back through, you know, to to buy a farm, and then and, and they went through see roller coaster. And you see on the deeds with with the farm I'm on, how one year it was eight, two years later it dropped down to nine hundred and twenty-five dollars. Now you know, was he in dire needs and dire straits that maybe he had to sell? I don't know. Because uh, a lot of those times, you know, you get people, people had a hard life uh, at the time. I know Dave would be in um, and I think if, if Dave looks close at some of the pictures, he's up over the hill from me now. Uh, if you look close at some of the pictures back when Michael and even my great-grandfather great owned it, there is no woods between us. That was all fields. That was farm up there. So that's that's field. Field. And right now, right now it's about 40 acres of woodland that's you know, in that hollow and up the steep hill. Okay, anything else? <laughs> I hope I enlightened you and I hope I even caused some questions and if you ever, you know, can help out or I think that's one of the ways you find out the history of, of the area and, and we, we kind of bounce things off of each other and we can pick up things and Hopefully we can trace back and, and find out what happened, uh, you know, to the end of the point, how it grew and changed. Thank you, know, you Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Michael mentioned uh, tracing our roots.